Thank you so much for tuning in to Learn at Home. I know there's still people trickling in, um, but we're gonna get started. And we're really, really excited for today's topic because it is going to be talking about a really big project that Tree People has been tasked with. And we have our very own uh, plant nursery, native plant nursery manager, Jack Smith, to tell us all about it. And it's going to be really exciting. So please engage in the chat with us. Um, we'll do a little Q&A session at the end, but you can post your questions in the chat and we'll make sure to address any comments and questions you have. Learn at Home is Tree People's virtual program that we started earlier this year, and it allows us to bring you information and just a sense of you know, education and learning through these times that we're, you know, we find ourselves at home. So we've brought very interesting guest speakers so far. If you have followed us um, through the months, thank you so much. If you're new here, thank you for tuning in and we hope that you continue to learn with us. We are really grateful for our sponsors, including the Senator Legacy Fund for allowing this uh, program to continue. And we also would like to thank Subaru of Sherman Oaks for sponsoring this program. So Jack Smith, as I have already mentioned, is our uh, native plant nursery manager at Tree People. And today he has taken time out of his very busy schedule to talk about um, this exciting project where we're planting 3000 plus oak trees. And I will be your moderator. My name is Emmy. And so without further ado, I'm going to give the stage to Jack. Thank you so much, Emmy. And yeah, in addition to our partners, I also want to thank uh, the National Park Service for allowing us to plant on their lands, especially, uh, and also the Chumash people whose ancestral land it is. Uh, we are working in coordination with them to make sure we don't disturb any um, uh, culturally sensitive sites. There's also um, a lot of movies and things like that that are filmed out in this area. So we've been careful not to film in areas that have uh, historical significance for that reason and for the future purposes too. Um, it seems like every other time we're out there working, someone's filming a music video or a commercial. Um, so it's, it's nice to see so many people getting outside and uh, physically distancing. But anyways, so let's take a look at our screen here. Um, this picture was actually one of the hardest sections to plant so far. So it's a great place to start. Um, you can see in the background there where those uh, the dark, uh, dark part of the mountains, that is all fairly pristine chaparral slash oak woodland that burned in the Woolsey fire uh, two years ago. And even though it was, uh, the fire had, it had, it hadn't burned in 30 years, but that area stayed fairly pristine because people don't get up there too much. There's not a lot of invasive plants. The area that we're looking at in the foreground on the other hand, um, you may be able to tell is very highly disturbed. And um, where my uh, coworker, uh, I believe that's Miguel, is carrying those two buckets of water, that's actually a, a social trail for equestrians. So we're trying to work with the equestrians and not plant where they like to ride. You know, everyone has a right to access to the park, but um, we have to take that into consideration for our planting sites. This whole area, um, when we started digging, we started suspecting that they must have been ranching out here because the soil is so compact and just so hard. Um, and yeah, a hiker confirmed that with us recently. So it's been a, a learning process. We've definitely had to, the first week or two was a lot. It was kind of like hell week. I remember being in football in uh, high school where, <laughs> you know, our, we were all just so sore the next week, our feet, our, my, my hands felt like they had two different layers of skin, like it was a big blister basically from swinging a pickaxe all day and carrying buckets of water. But um, we're rolling right along and we've really hit our stride now. Our goal is 200 um, native trees in the ground per week and we'll go into which species and all that uh, moving forward. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Emmy, please. So here's our map of the, uh, the Paramount Ranch site. And um, we are a little more than halfway uh, 
done with this site right now. So um, we can, uh, we can actually skip on to the next one. This is just to give you a quick overview of where we are. So where exactly is Paramount Ranch? I'm not oh, sure everybody is yeah. familiar with. I'm glad you asked. Um, actually, I don't have the exact address on me, but if you look up Paramount Ranch, it's just off of Cornell and uh, just south of the um, 101 freeway. Yeah. And there we go. Okay. So when we first arrived on site, um, it was really highly disturbed. First of all, with fire restoration, um, it's really important that we don't just go in there right after the fire when things are still smoldering and just start jamming in trees and you know wish them luck. Especially with uh, the chaparral ecosystem, a lot of times after a fire, the soil is actually hydrophobic because of some of the oils that are in a lot of these plants. And so, if you were to water it, um, it would actually it, it would roll right off the surface of the soil. A lot of times, that's why um, after a big fire event, we're worried about mudslides is because a lot of these, there's nothing really holding the soil down anymore. Um, but in this area, you can see all those dead stands of trees. Those are willows. And we actually added that section. It wasn't a part of our original um, assessment, but we saw that it needed some help and we had trees to put there. So we started clearing out all this invasive uh, brush, mustard, um, invasive annual grasses that are highly flammable and um, they serve as flash fuels in the event of a fire. So that's partially why these areas, the more they're burned, the more they're going to burn because it's a self-perpetuating cycle. The invasive grasses, um, they have no problem with fire. They love it. They're gonna survive it. But our, our native chaparral in Oak Woodland, it actually needs a few decades between fires in order to have um, enough in the seed bank to recover or to have their bark built up uh, dense enough to survive a fire as our um, oaks are fire adapted but not fire dependent as other species. Um, anyway, in the foreground, and we can see uh, some of our staff, mainly our Southeast LA team has been helping us out a lot. Um, and um, we also have some dedicated uh, biological science interns who are some wonderful folks you'll see in other pictures too who um, they have a contract with me and we, unfortunately I can't afford to pay them or hire them, but also they're not, a lot of times not yet qualified. So what our contract is that whatever we're working on, they agree to help me and then uh, we give them work experience. And then I, they can also use me as a reference um, or you know if they need me to, to write a letter or something like that, but that way, you know, I have a lot of friends um, that are in this the native plant world, and uh, sometimes I'll just gently tease them. A lot of, not a lot of people. Some people are um, overeducated and underexperienced, so you might have the degree, but you can't dig a hole, or you can't back up a truck with a trailer on it, or you know, do some of these other kind of intimidating things that um, the real job is going to require, other than just the experience. So I kind of I try to find people who need to bridge that gap just to get them over and get them in that entry level position that way they can start their career. And to be fair, I also had to do an unpaid internship uh, here with Tree People and a couple of my other coworkers also are, um, we also did interns, um, internships. Um, Emily, who is my right hand person on this project and in the nursery was an intern of mine, um, of ours throughout the COVID pandemic. And then finally I was able to hire Emily. Uh, oh, sorry, we can go on the next slide. That's okay. I love hearing about this because I also started as a field intern, not in LA, but it's interesting to learn about what the internship experience is like at Tree People. It makes me like miss the field, <laughs> as I always say, <laughs> yeah. but anyways. They get to do all the fun stuff actually, because the higher up you go, the more emails you have to do and the more office stuff exactly. you have to do. So, yeah, I remember when I was an intern, like we would get, you know, people from higher positions come out once in a while, and they always seem to be super excited to be back in the field and you ask them like what they do and they're just like, oh, I'm just in the office. And they're, they're, they miss the field pretty much. So anyways, that's. <laughs> yeah. No, I totally agree. Uh, in fact, one of our, our newest interns now is up in the nursery potting up 
plants and I feel like I haven't been to the nursery in over a month. Um, so I kind of miss it, but it's nice to see so many of our plants getting in the ground and we'll cover that in a second. Um, so here we have uh, another uh, blend of staff and interns. Um, Olivia in the blue there actually is a great example of someone that I'm um, talking about. She already works at state parks, but um, she's to get on the veg crew is a different um, to a different test or something like that. So while Olivia's super smart, you know she hadn't hadn't used an auger before, which we'll see in another picture and other things like that. So giving people experiences that they could put on their resume and that they'll have next to the tree people name that other people recognize and be like, oh, they worked at tree people, cool. That makes them uh, shine a little brighter uh, through the stack of uh, you know, job applications. Uh, let's see, behind them, that is one of our primary species we're growing. That's the a big, beautiful valley oak. Um, these uh, trees are magnificent. They were on our, they've been on our logo for a long time and um, they can grow, if everything goes according to plan, be 600 years old. Um, so this one is at least a couple hundred years and we have so far planted uh, 239 of them in this area and, we, and uh, we're gonna keep planting more. Let's see, um, well, let's do, one thing we need to consider too um, is being that it's fire season, air quote, because we have to be really conscious of the wind conditions and other things like that. And um, in fact, that's the only reason I have a Twitter account is just to keep up with what's on fire currently and is it near us? Um, but what we're using there to, for the brush clearance are called McLeods. And uh, those are firefighting tools. That way we can scrape around um, for one, clear space around this big, beautiful valley oak but also make room for more around her. And um, what we do is we're, we're, we're just doing what nature does with just a little bit of help. So we're probably gonna plant three or four um, alongside that valley oak. That way it'll be the next generation to come up when that valley oak eventually dies, but it eventually, it's gonna be around for a long time. It's still got plenty of, uh, of life and uh, acorns to give us too. Um, next slide, please. So before we get to plant anything, we have to do um, a lot of stuff in the nursery first. Uh, we get a lot of acorn uh, donations and we also go out in the field and collect them. We have to be really conscious of the um, health and vigor of the tree being collected from. So if something doesn't look right, there's a staining or there's some kind of bug or you know anything like that, we don't wanna collect from uh, specimens that could be sick with something. So that is part of what we call our BMPs or best management practices. Um, in the photo here is another really important part of our BMPs. Uh, this is Barbara, who's one of our dedicated uh, nursery and uh, field interns. And then that's um, Angeline, who is one of our former interns. And these pictures were taken uh, prior to the pandemic for uh, context about not being masked up. But um, thank you to Boeing who was able to support us and purchase this um, steam generator for us. It's a big intimidating machine and it gets really hot. Um, it's currently off in this picture, but if this were running, um, Angeline would get a really, really bad sunburn. It's about 1100 degrees Fahrenheit coming out of that chimney when it's running. And um, the reason we use this machine is because there's a lot of potential for uh, pathogens to catch a ride. Nurseries are potential breeding grounds for pathogens. And um, once a once something is outplanted that's sick, it's really difficult, if not impossible, for humans to um, control those harmful pathogens. The main one we're worried about is Phytophthora, which um, a few people probably know if you've ever heard of the potato famine. That was an example of Phytophthora. In Greek, it literally means plant destroyer, and we can go into that later on if you'd like, but uh, basically, the uh, peat moss that is part of our uh, native plant mix comes from Canada. The perlite that is also in our plant mix comes from Mexico. And then it's assembled here in the park with staff and volunteers. And along the way, it goes to all these different facilities, some of which, I mean, I visit the ones that I purchased from, but I don't know where that, the, the distribution center was from. So I don't know how clean these places are. And per our BMPs, we don't assume, like COVID actually, that anything is clean. So we are steaming it to 140 degrees Fahrenheit for a minimum 30 minutes. 
which is what you see here. And all of our plants um, that we'll be showing you have been grown using these protocols. And uh, to predict a, a question, wouldn't that hurt the vigor of the plants? Well, we'll show you the plants themselves and, and most of them look fine. We don't use any fertilizer or anything like that either, but uh, we, we'll start uh, adding a little bit for different species as needed. Next slide, please. Cool, so um, here's a couple more interns. Uh, there's uh, Kylie and Charlotte on the left there, and then Emily, who was an intern for a while and is now on staff is on the right. And um, these, um, what, these are what all our trees go through. Uh, looks like Kylie's potting up some uh, Southern Black Walnut, which we're planting at um, Paramount and Chesborough Canyon. Uh, we're also growing a bunch here in the nursery. If you have, I'd be happy to tell people how to grow them if they want to on the side chat or something like that. But it's the same uh, process we use to grow our acorns, which is just you put them in a bag of soil, keep it damp. If you want, you can keep it at room temperature. And if you want, uh, you can keep it in the fridge and either way works and we've had really good luck with that. Um, looks like Charlotte is also working on uh, walnuts. These are actually been growing really well. Um, we had a plant shortage and that was what was in season. So we just like a big squirrel. I was on the side of Coldwater Canyon um, picking up acorns across the street from Harvard Westlake. And uh, now several hundred of them are growing in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, one cool thing about the walnuts too is that they are endemic to our area and uh, they're being unfortunately um, removed due to overdevelopment. They, um, they're deciduous, so they don't look pretty half of the year, but I think they're gorgeous all year round. They have really pretty bark and they're edible, uh, make a cool dye and a bunch of other cool stuff. Um, Could yeah. you um, help define what endemic is? Some people might not know what that means. Yeah, absolutely. It just means that it, gr it only grows in this part of the world specifically um, Southern cool. California as far as uh, Santa Monica Mountains, I know is a, uh, their main population. I have to double check, I've, I'm gonna fact check myself on that, but I know that they're endemic to Southern California. I don't know for sure about Santa Monica Mountains. I'm sure someone's gonna correct me on that right now. But um, anyway, um, and oh yeah, and then as part of our BMPs too, you'll notice how clean the nursery is. Um, I've worked in a couple different nurseries, actually a few now, um, and a lot of times it's frankly, it's kind of like a little old man cave. And, um, you know, I, I get it when you, you see that same pile of stuff in the corner, you kind of, it doesn't, uh, you don't see it anymore. But um, fortunately my, uh, my time spent in uh, food service made me kind of OCD. So I was actually able to apply the, uh, my Starbucks cleaning skills um, to the nursery and, uh, this is all, we're actually the second uh, nursery in LA County that has these strict protocols to grow. Um, well, we're in the process of being certified, but uh, to grow clean plant stock for the forest service. The reason that we need to make sure that it's clean, as I said, other than the soil coming from all these different places and the plants being collected could also potentially introduce pathogens um, is that we have a small nursery space. We only have one greenhouse and we're growing for about five different projects. So those are plants from different five different regions all coming together in a perfect breeding ground. So you're only as clean as the dirtiest thing in the nursery is kind of how we see it. Um, and so anyway, that's a little bit of background on what you're seeing here. Uh, another thing really quick is some people might ask about the containers we're using. Those are called zip sets. Um, they are 96% biodegradable. It has a small bit of film, uh, like a waxy film, similar to what you get on the, your disposable uh, cup of coffee. And um, while I, I hate to use single use stuff, um, it increases our capacity, uh, like quad, quadruples it really. And uh, we like to think the ends justify the means. Most of it does break down. Um, and yeah, we can just we can save a lot more plants and a lot more open spaces with more plants. So, um, yeah, I think ready for the next slide. Okay, this is another nursery that we have. This is at the Mountains Restoration Trust, which uh, Tree People recently merged with, and this is a little shade house. So this is just to keep the squirrels away. We keep them watered. These are where these trees um, have now all been planted in the ground, um, but you know as um. Emily and I like to joke, squirrels can be kind of mean and they just want to kill our stuff. And so we, 
we put all this work into it. We steam the soil and then, you know, you put your tree in the ground and then a, crumb will, a squirrel will come and eat it and, or just bite its head off. And it's really sad. So that's why they're in the shade house here. Uh, ready for next slide. All right, so uh, now after all that work, after all the brush clearance, because of all this um, land disturbance in the area, we're finally ready to dig a hole, but we run into soil that's like a brick wall. So this is what um, Olivia was so excited to use this auger. I, I love when people are excited to use these uh, intimidating tools, but it's, um, it's a big drill and we can't use it year round or, or all any time we want because of uh, red flag warnings. If something's, if it's too windy or if the fire conditions are um, too hazardous, then we can't use these power tools. But on that day, it was safe to do so. And that whole hillside um, is now planted with the valley oaks. But uh, yeah, if anyone wants to learn how to use an auger, use some tools or a pickaxe, then we'd be happy to show you. Uh, so those are our vehicles in the back, obviously. Can't do our jobs without them. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think that pretty much covers it for this slide. OK. Like I said, sometimes we have to just use uh, hand tools. And a lot of times, it's even better to use a pickaxe rather than an auger or something like that. Uh, that's what Todd here in the foreground is doing. He is another one of our BioSci interns. And um, this is, again, this is where that first picture was showing, the, the, the cowboy trails. So the soil is super compacted. And even with the auger, uh, we can barely get in the ground. So that's definitely slowed our progress down a little bit. Uh, prior to this new surge of cases in COVID, we were still able to have uh, some small, well-controlled groups. This is a group from uh, Boyish Genes who came out and supported our restoration efforts. And they're a really hardworking group. Um, but uh, it, yeah, anyone who's sad about the gym being closed once we can have more people back, we have plenty of buckets of water to move around. And if you wanna learn how to use a pickaxe, then uh, be happy to show you. Then one thing that we would do uh, as well as our, um, you know, tool safety and the intro stuff is show, demo how to dig a hole. Um, well, this picture is taken mid swing and he's gonna continue going down it with the with follow through with the swing. But that's like the one point where you wouldn't want to stop with a pickaxe because the two pieces aren't actually connected and you could hurt your hands. Anyway, um, ready for next slide. Um, I have a question, Jack. Yeah. So all of the dead grass that you see on the ground here, is that just uh, weeds that have been burnt and so you don't really need to remove them before you plant the oaks? I'm really glad you asked that. So th that's a species called wild oat, um, similar to what you have in your oatmeal. And yeah, we don't need to remove it. We did mow that area um, just to reduce the, the ladder fuel that it would become, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take off. If a fire event were to come through here right now, it would probably smolder a little bit, but it wouldn't, um, that stuff gets to be about three to four feet tall, um, more like three feet tall. But um, yeah, we just cut it down. We also do a bird survey before we cut anything down. Um, we're also looking out for rocks, snakes, um, things like that. But basically we make like a kind of like a skirmish line before we go in and, and start brush cutting. And we're just kind of announcing our presence to these animals and making sure that even though they're not nesting right now, um, there's nothing in there that we're gonna accidentally hurt. So, um, but, but yeah, it's back to your question though. We don't need to remove it. Um, in fact, we're using it as mulch because the seeds have already dropped and we need um, shade and mulch structures for our trees. Our oaks, um, they like to live in communities. I like to think of oaks as elephants. They get to be like really big, but they need enough resources to sustain themselves. So ideally, all of our trees would have been grown underneath or near um, its mom or grandma or you know whatever tree it's near. These trees have it really hard, not only because the soil is so inhospitable, but also because um, uh, they don't have any shade. So we've been able to make use of those materials. Oh, ready for it, next cool. slide. And finally, we get trees in the ground. Um, this is one of our little baby oaks. Uh, this is a valley oak. And um, yeah, I love 
I love the shape, um, those beautiful lobes. Um, and yeah, they're just a gorgeous, they have gorgeous bark. It's a gorgeous tree. You can see um, that there's a little bit of a wire mesh on the bottom there. Those are from a company called Volking. And um, they're actually on back order now because we have been ordering so much of them and telling our, our partners in the area about how uh, useful they are at preventing um, uh, subterranean herbivory, just a fancy way of saying gophers get them. Uh, we had a big planting event at this park last year and of the several thousand that got put in the ground, nine individuals survived. Not 9%, not 99. Um, and that's all because of underground herbivory. Also, they, because of red flag warnings, they weren't able to get in there to do maintenance as often as they wanted to. Um, but so this is a very important part of our process. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to dig a hole, but for mountain forestry, we always put water in the bottom of the hole first. And as we backfill the soil, um, we put a little bit of water each time. That way we reduce the, the potential for evaporation and uh, make sure that the tap root has a, has a lot of water already in the ground for it to go. We're, we're not expecting a whole lot of rain anytime soon. So that's why you see quite a bit here. There's, we give about each tree three or four gallons um, when we plant them. And then we add mulch on top. And uh, we have gone through with one round of watering since planting, but most of our trees actually still are very damp. Um, ready for next slide. Okay, so this was, uh, we had to have an adaptive strategy here. The, we started on election day, it was when we, our first day of planting, and we figured that we didn't have our chicken wire yet for the top cages, so we thought that they'd be okay um, with, for 48 hours. But we came back and ground squirrels really uh, went nuts, especially when uh, the trees are most vulnerable in this state when they're going from the nursery to uh, the field. And that's because they've had the sweet life being taken care of and protected. And now they're going to have to go out in the real world and get a job. So this one, fortunately, has been protected. Uh, we have a uh, chicken wire cage on top. That's to prevent mainly the ground squirrels, but also deer, potentially rabbits, but mainly squirrels. And um, that white flag, it helps us uh, not only water, but also um, to see them. It also tells us which species that is. Uh, the white oaks are, or the valley oaks are in the white oak family, so we gave them white flags. Um, we had talked about the shade structures before. Fortunately, there were some natives in the area that we were able to use for that also. The, um, the broader leaf plant you see there is a native plant. It's an annual called uh, doveweed. It's also called turkey mullein and fish poison. Uh, the botanical name is croton sediger, but um, I was able to pull it and just prop it up against the tree, against the cage, that by giving it that shade that it would normally be growing under. And uh, also it's dropping its seed in the uh, planting, uh, the water basin. So that way, um, hopefully this spring, we'll get some more doveweed growing in there. I don't know why it's called doveweed. Um, people called it fish poison because apparently uh, Chumash and other people, you would uh, make a little dam in a creek when you see fish and then you drop this stuff upstream and the bristly hairs on the uh, the croton sediger there would actually block the gills and allow people to collect the fish. It doesn't actually poison them, but um, that, anyways, that's one account that I heard on why that has the, the name fish poison. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think that's about it for this slide. And then finally, uh, we get to name it if you'd like to. Um, I have, we have 3,650 of these to, uh, to name. So we give them all a number, but our um, staff and volunteers often like to name the trees. This is actually our uh, director, uh, Daniel Berger, and his son, Isaac, who was so cool. He is the toughest little kid. He's three years old and he, all he wanted to do, he kept on wanting to plant more trees and dad was tapping out after four hours, but um, Isaac planted, I think, four trees that day, and he was really excited to plant one of the walnuts, uh, which is what he's uh, standing over here, and this walnut's name is Cuckoo, um, but uh, yeah, that was one of our last uh, planting sites, which is also by um, 
a social equestrian trail. So it was fairly hard digging there too. Um, ready for the next slide. I guess one thing we can't um, overstate enough is how challenging all this work has been during the pandemic. Um, I mean, I'm really grateful to have a career uh, where I get to be with so many wonderful people outdoors. And even though it's just a disturbed area, uh, it's still very beautiful. And as you can see, we can very easily, safely, uh, physically distance. The tough part has been we can't, of course, carpool um, with, with volunteers and interns and stuff like that. We've been getting tested, some of us monthly, some of us more often when we have um, in our orbit, someone who suspects they may have come into contact with COVID, they self-isolate and um, they can't go to work. We have them making cages or something from home or work on whatever else. But, um, but as you can see, even though this was just a couple of weeks ago, we have, we have lots of space in between us and we're being as safe as we can. But uh, sadly, we can't have too many people out with us right now. We're at, um, we have a 15 person capacity right now. Um, but each day it's different. So we, if you're even a, an intern, supervisor and staff, you're always welcome. And I would love to open this up to general volunteers soon. Um, we had an event yesterday, but it was a little bit too big, frankly, for comfort. So we, uh, we made sure to spread everybody out in under, uh, fortunately we're on 10 acres. So with all this staff, we can have adjacent events, but we only have so many trucks and tools. And uh, we're using all the hand sanitizer that we can, lots of breaks. Um, but yeah, just got to commend our team for how tough they've been. Um, it's weird for me to talk this long without wearing a mask, actually. I just like, I don't know. Uh, it's a culture shock at this point. Um, let's see. I think that was the last slide. Um, yes, I think it is. And I wanted to just say that, you know, in the on Instagram and uh, on the registration, it, we encouraged people to get involved. And that was before we um, unfortunately have to uh, limit the, the volunteering events due to recent surges in, in COVID. But please fall, keep your eyes open for future opportunities because we do need to get these trees planted. So as soon as we're able to have more volunteers again, then we will let you know. And uh, Jack, I wanted to uh, ask if you could talk a little bit about wildlife conservation, because I know this is like mountain lion habitat yes. and that this project is going to serve as a wildlife corridor. So can you talk a bit on that? Thank you for reminding me. I totally forgot about that. And uh, to the broader context of, uh, well, when anyone, if any of you are driving from LA to Orange County or, or the other way, and you see that the lanes open up that's why we're planting these. Um, a portion of those, uh, the 10,000 trees that tree people is committed to planting uh, to mitigate or rather offset the freeway expansion, um, we're planting also in uh, open spaces. So in addition to doing fire mitigation from the Woolsey fire, we're also mitigating um, the effects of having a wider freeway. Um, also, to, uh, Emmy was just talking about, um, there's going to be a wildlife crossing for mountain lions and other pop and other animals at Liberty Canyon, which is just an exit or two away from where we are here at Paramount. And um, we're going to be planting on both sides of this um, wildlife crossing. This is on the south side of it, and then Chesboro's on the north. And basically, we're going to be helping these mountain lions um, and other things that they rely on, like deer, coyotes, uh, you know foxes, badgers, all this stuff that are in the area, helping them get across the freeway and not be hit by a car. Um, it's really sad, but uh, you know, our Santa Monica mountain population is, um, they're hanging in there, but they really need the genetic diversity. So they're gonna try to connect them over to the uh, Los Padres um, mountain lion population to um, help the gene pool. Um, in fact, one of the, uh, we have a wildlife camera we monitor here at Tree People and uh, the reason we have that is because P22 before, which is Puma 22, um, before he um, made it over to Griffith Park, his dad was gonna basically, um, they're competing for territory. 
So P22 had to cross the 405 and the 101, I believe, then go through our park and then make it all the way to Griffith Park. And is the, he only, he's the, the mountain, he, he's the mountain land that has the smallest range in the world. Normally they have a range of about 200 miles, I believe. And P22 has a range of nine, including um, forest lawn. So anyway, there's definitely mountain lions in this area. Um, where's my bone? This one isn't from our site, but we found, we find a lot of bones that are not people. And so there's definitely some big kitties in the area, definitely some coyotes and other things that are enjoying our work. Um, every time we come out to a site we just cleared, we see more predators that are controlling the ground squirrels. So we like to joke that they are the employees of the week. But um, yeah, thank you for, for reminding me to address that, Amy. Um, one more question from me. Um, how long do you think it'll take for this area to serve as like a full wildlife corridor that mountain lions and other animals can use? Really, um, it's far, so when we're planting a lot of these trees, we do so knowing that we're probably not gonna sit under their shade um, in our lifetime. That being said though, um, it is already functioning as habitat. Um, like I said, right. their food is already there. Um, deer, coyotes, the things that mountain lions like to eat, it's already out there. We're just helping them out. Uh, and also the Valley Oaks um, does a few different resources on native plants, but according to, to Calscape, I believe, as well as reading, they can put on um, several feet within the first five years. So we might actually get to see some of this shade fairly soon. We just have to make sure that they make it through the first season and get established. But I, so I guess to answer your question, uh, when we can start seeing the benefits from these trees, right about the time we're about to wrap up the project, which would be about two years. Um, that's when they'll actually start to show up um, and be noticeable without flags, I think. Um, yeah, good question. All right, well, um, before we jump into the q and I know there's lots of questions in the chat. Thank you so much for your questions. I know, Jack, you kind of wanted to also touch on the global picture of climate change and uh, fire mitigation in the future as um, one of the benefits of this project as well. Do you want to touch on that? Sure. Well, one of the things that we're doing, I mean, so there was a question about, you know, do we need to remove these invasive species, like scrape the ground entirely, or we just don't have the resources for that. But what we are doing is when we're watering our in our planting basins, we're kind of tricking the plants that are in that seed bank to germinate already. Um, they're just growing with the trees. So we can do a lot of early weeding as we go. Um, that way, when another fire comes through and there will, this area will burn again and again, hopefully just not too soon. Um, when that happens, these trees will have the uh, buffer space necessary to survive. And these species, again, as I said, are all uh, fire adapted. Another thing we're gonna do as part of our management strategy is um, once we get our planting phase done, uh, we have a bunch of native seeds from annuals and perennial plants, plants that live more than just one year um, to put around them too. You know, one of my friends, uh, our former wildland restoration manager, Cody, would like to say that, you know, planting a tree in the middle of a field is like uh, putting a man on the moon and then saying, okay, well, we'll be back in 50 years, make the place look nice. And it's like, no, they, they need more than just, um, it need, takes more than just trees. These need shrubs, these need grasses, they need annuals. So we're gonna bring uh, or help supply those wildflowers and things like that around the trees to give them uh, those benefits. The answer? I love that analogy. All right, um, well, so uh, several people are asking in the chat to just kind of clarify on the state of volunteering right now. So can you do that? Because I don't even really know. Yeah, so my understanding is of this morning is that we have um, the capacity for 15 people at a time, which obviously given the space you can see between us, um, I'm comfortable with that. Um, I guess the best way would be to reach out uh, to our volunteer coordinator, Luis Rodriguez. And he's been really helpful with 
helping me because I can't, I'm in the field four days a week. I can't possibly keep up with um, approving the intern or volunteers individually. Um, so he's been helping me make sure that our, uh, our numbers are appropriate and safe. So um, yeah, L Rodriguez, we can put that um, in the chat or, um, or make those. Make, yeah, we can include it in the follow-up um, email. Yeah. And then so also. You... Oh, okay. oh uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, um, I was going to say that, um, you know, while we are in the field four days a week, we also do have some nursery volunteer opportunities. Um, we need help watering stuff. Uh, a lot of my, a lot of our walnuts are growing faster than we have time to pot them up. Um, and I just steamed a new batch of soil. So that's what uh, Minerva and um, Emily were working on a little bit today. Hopefully I'll get to pot something today. Cause I, this is like the Wednesdays are the one day I don't get to get dirty and it feels weird to come home clean. So um, hopefully I can go to do something in the nursery for a little bit before my next Zoom meeting. Um, but uh, yeah, I would definitely welcome some more help in the nursery, which I think right now is, well, for one, it's the safest place in the world, in, in my opinion, because we're literally in a cage and we are already, uh, the masks and the six feet, those are, the, are really the only two things that are different for us for the nursery regarding the pandemic. Other than that, it was already super clean. And um, being in a cage, we can make sure that, you know, the general public uh, doesn't get within our personal space. Uh, but yeah, I need help. Okay, well, do you think that people can email you directly if they're interested in helping you in the nursery? I would say again, Luis, just because um, I would feel bad if not being able to respond bonds quickly enough um okay yeah sounds good you know it's the best way we'll to get a hold of me but you know just so i don't leave people hanging and i, I don't feel bad right uh, there's okay. a on the chat that it's been postponed for this year uh if you guys want to read that that makes sense all right yeah we're getting live updates because of just you know how quickly things are changing so Yes, emailing Luis would be the best place to, to find out. And also, you know, when everything is hopefully safe again, if you just go on to our events calendar on our Tree People website, we'll have updated information there. So keep us in mind in going into the future as well, not just for this project, but we'll always need help as long as we're planting trees and doing projects. So we have some other questions. Um, Chuck asked, what is the timeline to complete this project? Good question. So originally it was by the end of the year, which was impossible. Uh, but fortunately we've been able to get an extension for the planting season. We're looking at the end of March at a rate of approximately 200 trees in the ground per week. And uh, we're gonna be then maintaining them for the next two years. Uh, at the end, the, the, our success criteria is 80% uh, survival at the end of two years. Awesome, thank you. Liz, uh, sorry, Kamara asks, how often do you plan to go back and water the oaks before the rainy season? Right, so right now we've been giving them the, uh, the this is our scientific tool for seeing if the soil is wet, um, but we just give them a poke. We've only, even with the, we just watered again yesterday, but even, just doing so, we did that because of some herbivory and to give them some help. Um, but the soil was still damp because of the mulch and everything. Um, and these trees are tough, even though, you know, some of them have been grazed on by ground squirrels. I remember one of the first projects I was managing uh, with the Mountains Restoration Trust off Stunt Road, one of my coast live oaks, I still remember it was oak number five, um, it had been run over by a car and um, if you know, if anyone's familiar with Stunt Road, people drive too fast and then sometimes they crash. Um, so this person, the, the car and the tow truck drove over one of my trees and me just being really stubborn, I just watered it anyway and it came back. So, um, wow. That's yeah. <laughs> so even though, um, yeah, to answer your question though, it'd be ideal to water them once a week in a perfect world because of the scale and the intensity of our uh, planting schedule, we'll probably gonna be watering them about once a month, but we'll be checking on them and uh, making sure that they're not getting too dry. Yeah, good question. 
Cool. And then Alian asks, who is paying for the project? I know you you um, wanted to, to mention that as well. Yeah. Um, so this is, as I understand, at least uh, the grants through Caltrans. Also, uh, Boeing was very supportive of our work, specifically in the uh, the prep stages, because I, as I understand it, the um, the Caltrans money was only able to help us for actually putting trees in the ground, not necessarily for growing, sourcing, uh, and uh, the brush clearance. All the prep work we have to do was supported uh, by the the Boeing and the um, uh, the forest aid fund that we have through them. Um, also, the corporate groups that we've had, we've only had a couple, we've had to keep rescheduling some, but um, there's Boyish Jeans. Um, we did another event with Good American and then um, Axios Trucking was going to be Friday, but because of the surge, we're going to reschedule um, them for, uh, for 2021. Um, and by Caltrans, you mean the I-5 expansion, the California transportation? Yeah. So it's kind of like their environmental offset for expanding the highway. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some other funders, and I'm sorry about that. I, I kind of try to keep myself out of that as much as possible. I just go out and spend the money and do all the fun things. So other other more organized people than me um, work on that part. Yes, we have our um, separate departments working on all of the different components for this project. Um, so we have other questions. Um, yes, the nursery is at Tree People at our Coldwater Canyon Park. Has anyone ever written a history of Tree People? Interesting, I don't know. I, I think there's a timeline on our website. There's a I think there's a timeline of tree people on our website. There could be several. So, uh, feel free and yeah. Hopefully, Jim. We also have a YouTube channel. It would be cool for uh, there to be a up to date history video of tree people. Thank you for the idea, Liz. And let's see. Christine asks, "What are all the tree species being planted?" Oh, you're right. Thank you for bringing that up. Cause I I covered a couple, but. Not in uh, enough detail. Um, so we I already showed you the uh, valley oaks or the Quercus lobata. Those were sourced from uh, MRT and other um, other areas uh, in in the Santa Monica mountain range. All these are local to these this mountain range, which is important to note. There's also the coast live oak. Um, we're planting about we're planting the most coast live oaks or Quercus agrifolia. And uh, before I forget, thank you to Antonio Sanchez of the Satwiwa um, Native Plant Nursery. Uh, they're gonna be donating with MPS, or National Park Service, uh, half of the trees approximately for this project. So thank you so much to Antonio and his group. Um, but uh, so yeah, Valley Oak, Coast Live Oak, Scrub Oak, which is the Quercus berberitifolia. Uh, it's a really underrated tree, um, but I love it. It's it's really tough little drought tolerant shrub and it's actually one of the species that gives uh, sh the chaparral ecosystem its name and then we're planting a uh, southern black walnut or juglans californica again those are the endemic trees that are edible they have a, a black dye and um, they're just really cool i planted one at the house i rent help my landlord doesn't mind and um and then we're doing um willow cuttings which is um, royal willows and, or um, Salix uh, lazio lepis. And with those, we just take a cutting of about a foot long, soak it. We soaked ours for about a week in water, just like a couple inches. And you have to defoliate, so it kind of looks like this. And then we drive them as deep in the ground as we can. And then we give them a little haircut on top. And then we, we water those. And those are, um, those are, I think, have the most specific um, habit like needs because they need more water than any of these other species. So we've been planting them where we see other willows already growing and that tells us that there's enough water to support them. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have three more questions which uh, I think that'll be all the time that we have to address those three questions. Um, Sarah asks, have you been using Bioshar or any type of fertilizers? biochar or any type of fertilizers when planting? Good question. 
Um, you know, when I took over the nursery uh, position about two years ago, we inherited some biochar and um, I never really, sometimes on a whim, we'll just pepper it into the soil mix, but as a dominant ingredient, nope. Um, for the most part, our, our mix has been approximately 50-50 for peat moss and perlite, and then we add some sand and some other things uh, to give it a little more drainage. Uh, it's actually probably more like 40, 60 peat moss to perlite. Um, and then, yeah, no, no fertilizers so far. Um, I've noticed that our trees are very low maintenance, which is great um, because it's really inexpensive, but the shrubs, I'm tempted to start um, having a, a wider variety of mixes because I think our shrubs, uh, some of them at least seem to need a little bit more um, in the soil for them to get started. Great. Um, Abigail asks, are ground squirrels invasive? Why are they such an issue? Also, what happens to the chicken wire after it's put around the tree? Um, I'm really glad you asked both those questions. I screwed up. I'm like leaning over the desk too much. Later. Okay. Um, there are some that are native to the East Coast those that are here. Um, you, you often hear those in the trees. Um, they're really loud, chattery squirrels. These ground squirrels, as far as I know, are native. Um, I'm fairly up to date with, uh, with their status, but part of the reason that they are such a problem is because of all of these really tall invasive plants. Um, obviously, you're, what you're seeing has already been prepped and mowed, but um, what I've noticed doing this for a few years now is that in areas where you have a lot of mustard specifically, um, the owls, coyotes, and other predators that would normally feed on, on these little mammals, they physically just can't get in there. And so the squirrels are low enough that they can make lots of intricate dens and burrows, um, but the predators haven't been able to get in there. So one thing that's been really cool about this project is that every morning when we get there, when we get to a site that we just cleared, we always see predators in our work areas that are, um, they're eating gophers for us. I'd heard this before, but I'd never seen it until last week when we saw a great blue heron eating a gopher. And for those of you who are into birds, you may know that herons are typically, you associate with them with water and like fishing. So to see them eating gophers was really exciting. And then we always see um, coyotes now and it's been cool. Our coyotes in the area here, they often have red-tailed hawks with them flying very close to them. So I don't know if it's like a symbiotic hunting relationship or what. I know that they do have those relationships with badgers. But um, anyway, so that, that's all just to say that uh, the vegetation cover, the type conversion rather, from you know native plants to these annuals has given the... Um, these, this natural herbivore and un, um, an une unequal advantage, I guess. Awesome. All right. So final question from Sylvia. When wolves have has used cartoon carton co sorry carton cocoons for planting, have you considered using the same technology? And I forgot there was another question. Uh, Sorry, I forgot the previous person's name, but- uh, Oh, the chicken wire. Yes, the chicken wire. I'm also glad you asked that. We do remove it. The Volking, we, um, we think it, it's advertised on their site, um, but it does break down. It'll just become rusty and just melt away once, not melt away, but you know what I mean? It'll break down in the soil as we continue to water it. And hopefully the trees will be established enough so that they'll be able to um, you know, withstand gopher attacks uh, once, once they're mature, they can take that. Um, the chicken wire, we will remove those. Again, same thing. Once the trees are established and hardened off, which is just to say acclimated to their new conditions that are not in the nursery, then we will remove them. Uh, probably at the end of the maintenance period or um, some other point. Um, for the, um, the next question was about the milk cartons, right? Yes, I'm not sure um, what this is referring to because I just don't know, but uh, when wolves has used carton cocoons for planting, have you considered using the same technology? If it's the thing I'm thinking There's of. There's a link here. 
um, cartons. They are special uh, containers that um, if you look at that link that I put in there, um, they're special oh. containers that look like a donut and they're filled with water. They're filled with uh, water um, once and they provide the nutrient for the first year. The reason I'm asking is because I participated in a couple of uh, uh, big plantings with um, tree people. One of them was up on about 15 years ago um, uh, up in Angela's Crest. And all of those trees died because they did not have enough water. The second planting was a uh, May Jenny was in 2011. And we've been caring for that tree, for those trees actually for the past 10 years. And I'll send you a picture of what it looks like now. But it took us caring for the tree in order to help it grow. And we've lost many, many, many uh, trees. So uh, when I saw the new technology, I was wondering, would that help? I'm glad so you brought this up. So, so I'm glad you brought this up because we actually have used these in the past. Um, uh -huh. I, I, we, uh, we donated ours, frankly. Um, I know that they work for some people where they mm -hmm. didn't work for us mainly. Okay, so there's a couple of problems with this compacted soil and that um, those cocoons, I believe hold four or five gallons of water. I could be wrong, but even when you're augering, you know what the, the tree that we're using right now, you maybe need three, three augers in one planting basin. With something that big, you're looking probably more like 12. And while I can do, I can auger like all day and be okay, but I'm, I can't do everything. And so like, and a lot of people can't do augers all day. It's, it's a heavy thing to be operating. So it's a lot more digging for the installation. We're on an accelerated timeline. And most of our trees are in these tubes like this. Um, so it's a lot of hole to dig for one tree that we can do faster if we do it with just pickaxes and just hand watering. Um, one observation I've seen with the, um, with that technology too. Um, and this is, I think my main critique, no offense to them. And this is my own opinion. I'm not speaking on tree people's behalf right now, but um, is that mm -hmm. with that, that whole cavity should be roots. Whereas once the water's gone, even if you're refilling it, and that could be wrong, maybe some people have figured this out, but it would seem to make sense to me that you would need to at some point come in and fill that pocket in with soil. Because once the water's gone, you just have a cavity and then you're looking at liability like you know will a volunteer or a park visitor trip and fall in there could a ground squirrel make a nest in there would a rattlesnake make a nest in there or yellow jackets or some other um, organism that would make use of that pocket so mm -hmm. that's where i'm i'm not saying don't ever use them i'm just saying per our um, criteria and everything we have to do already i can't use them on this scale Mm -hmm. But I have seen them used successfully in other places, but so to your point, yeah. Great discussion. It's just that it takes, I learned something it, take, it takes a really long time for them to grow, and yeah. especially Corcus agrifolia, it takes forever. I mean, we have one that we planted five years ago, and it's just, uh, I mean, uh, growing it kind of in the in the wild wa watering it once a month it really takes a long time yeah. so um i don't know how they're going to survive yes you're planting a lot but they don't know if they're going to survive without them being adopted or having a plan to water them beyond the one year yeah no you're absolutely I mean, right the, as i said we, we are reforesting the major and for the I'm breaking up a little bit on me. And that's with uh, volunteers that are coming in periodically and they're watering and trees that we care for um, regularly. Yeah, and every project that I've worked on, I've been doing this professionally for five years. Um, mm -hmm. Every project I've worked on with Oaks has an accelerated timeline and you only have funding for maybe 18 months and that's it. And then you go on to the next thing. Um, my first project was at Nicholas Flats and I remember we had to establish 300 
in the ground in fifth, over 15 acres. And uh, this, there was a cowboy who was constantly trying to kill my trees. And so every time we had to replace a tree, the timeline starts all over again. And so it's just, um, I don't know, it's, I guess, first world problems. I don't know. <laughs> There's no, I don't really have a good answer for that. But I totally agree with you that these trees do take a long time to establish. And um, I, it all comes down to funding, unfortunately. And uh, but yeah, they, they're not operating on the same time scale as we are. They're going to be 250 years old. So. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for answering um, all of the great questions. Thank you for um, the great questions as well. It is 2.02 p.m. right now, so I will uh, close this up. And again, thank you so much for tuning in today. Follow us on social media if you don't already. And we look forward to seeing you um, soon. Thank you, everybody. Well. Everybody tunes out. Thank you so much. Drink water. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay safe and see you soon.